uh, call to order the January 6th, 2020 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Happy New Year. I got the date right. Uh, first up on our agenda this evening is EDR for Special Permit 3610. Apothka is back with us this evening. So, gentlemen, if you could come up, reintroduce yourselves, and walk us through what's taken place since our last meeting. Andrew, we might project some. Oh, yeah. That's um, right. Sure. Actually, we might all need this. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Phil Silverman uh, from Vicente Cedarburg on behalf of Apopka. This is Joseph Lethatch from, he is the CEO of the company. Uh, we had been responding back and forth to try to get you further information and respond to all of the inquiries. Uh, one of the things we didn't quite get a chance to respond to, we had done a traffic impact statement. There were some questions about that, and some of the staff wanted some figures um, put into that, that that they had come up with. And so we just got that today, and I'm going to give it to you. Um, it's uh, somewhat technical, um, and I'm going to try and simplify it. Unfortunately, our civil engineer at the last minute called had something of a family situation come up. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, I tried to avoid science and math as best I could. That's why I became a lawyer. But hopefully, I can walk through it anyway and, and give you the best explanation I can. Um, so if we can get to the document. Um, as you know, this is a special permit. We're going to be doing a co-located medical and adult use, otherwise known as recreational dispensary at 1386 Mass Ave. Um, and I'm just going to walk through the items that uh, Aaron had, had sent over to us, which I think was summarizing what you were looking for at the last meeting. If we can get down to, oh, not the statement, the other document, if we can, that would be great. There we go. Oh, fantastic. If we can get to Exhibit A. Um, that's great. Fantastic. So uh, item one uh, of what you would ask for is a sign plan that details the attachment method, the lighting, the sign materials, dimensions, etc. cetera. Um, so what we're looking at here, that's the image there, um, you know, uh, for, for the company. You'll see it's on the windows. We know that there is uh, a provision that requires that this sign not exceed 25% of the window. Um, it is a vinyl decal and we will comply. Uh, with the regulations regarding um, uh, the 25 percent rule there but that's that's what it would look like um, same exhibit you had also asked for the, uh, an improved uh, building elevation which shows storefront modifications and repair modifications to the facade this is again the elevation that we've, we're providing now um, one of the issues I know with the facade is there's some fading. Uh, we're going to be pressure washing the entire thing, so it will have a uniform look to it. Um, and, and there's also been a change to the floor plan. Maybe we'll go over that in, in a bit. Uh, but as a result, there was a door that was right almost in the middle of that facility. It's now been moved over to the left, so there are two doors that you can see. Um, you can kind of see one has some, some writing underneath it. That's the one that's been moved, and there's one just to the left of it, which is presently existing. Sorry to interrupt you. Is, sure. Is the plan for the Bank of America ATM still to be in this area? Yes. That vestibule? It is. And that vestibule will be cut off from the rest of the space. Okay. Okay. So the two, the door to the ATM will be right next to the entry door for your office. Correct. And you can't cross, right now you can cross from the ATM vestibule into the, the, into the storefront. That is going to be walled off. All right. Um, if we can go on to Exhibit B now, uh, the first page of it, that, that one right there. All right. Um, wonderful. So uh, there was a request to prepare a plan that details the trench drains across the enter-exit drive aisles and rain garden system in the landscaped area. Similarly, number four, you wanted us to investigate further improvement to the catch basins. The civil engineer explained to me that they looked into the rain garden concept. It, it wasn't doable with the amount of space that we had. And so what he uh, did instead, there's going to be some regrading. And then the newest technology are, are particle separators with catch basin grate inlets. And you can see those. There's one here and there's one here. That's what he's proposed to put in. And it's supposed to treat the water in the same way. It's supposed to have the same impact, as I understand it, 
Also with the grading, you'll notice that there's there's going to be a speed bump here and a speed bump there, which is going to keep the water from flowing off the property on that side. So that's that's the response on that particular issue. Um, small comment. Please. No, please. No, please. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with uh, putting a speed bump there. That, that does alleviate the problem of uh, water shedding across the public sidewalk and so forth. Yep. And um, the only thing I'm asking now is, uh, you have a curb along the back side there, uh, uh, where you have your garden, where it meets, meets the, uh, the real parking lot there. Okay. Could you put brakes in that curb so it would uh, so it'd be like another option of water getting into the ground? Uh, the system you provided allows water to be filtered in, but it still goes back into the storm drain. I get it. It does not go back into the ground itself, okay? Okay. And what we're looking for is to uh, maybe recharge uh, the surrounding grounds a little bit. Just give an attempt at it, okay? I mean, what sure. you've done there is, is a good job of eliminating the sidewalk back there and putting a garden there. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if you just go a, just a little bit further and the water is shedding to the back there anyways. It's going to be a natural gutter along there anyway. Just so I can understand, so are we talking up here, back that, here? That, where? No. Down here. Back here? Yeah. Okay. No, no. That right there, no? No. Yep, the up corner here? of the building. No, I'm sorry, if you could. Then. No pump. Everything is sort of draining this way yes mm -hmm. so if you just there's a curve that goes right along here where you have your garden okay, okay. If, you, if you put a couple of brakes right here that allows some water to get into that garden okay here, okay yeah. oh, okay we're not asking much but what it doesn't yeah. allow to do is it allows it to uh have a possibility of recharging that there yep and it now adds back groundwater to your area there mm -hmm. okay yeah I, we'll do the best we can for that obviously and I mean, that's that's the, that was the other thing where i had asked them to put the train train further up so that the water would be caught there, then, could, then the trench ring could actually drain into that okay. area there. Let, let, I, I'm, I will talk to the civil engineer. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do it, yeah. uh, unless he, he explains there's a reason we can't, but it seems fine to me. If we can, we will. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Um, okay, um, next, I think the next exhibit, yeah, landscape plan. Um, they wanted it improved uh, and discussing some screening solutions. Um, there is a fence now that's going to be put in on the south and the eastern property lines. Um, and we had some difficulty getting in touch with the tree warden. Um, what we've put, you'll see a note, you can't really read it, I think, on this, but down here, what we basically said is whatever the tree warden says we should plant, that's what we're going to plant. Uh, <laughs> Just to make it clear, uh, we don't really have much of a problem. We just haven't been able to connect at this point. So uh, that's not a problem at all. But we have been paying very much attention to the whole rat issue. And so we will make sure to have the current landscaping taken care of with that in mind to make sure that they don't just scatter and everywhere. You mentioned the fence. Does that go to the concern that one of the abutters had of the, the rotted fence <coughs> last time around? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay. and we'll work. <laughs> I, I think we, the civil said he might have tried once to call and didn't get a call back. But maybe mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure we can okay. have that discussion and we can work on that to make sure that it's acceptable and it works. Okay. She's she's in the back, yeah. so I'll call on her when it's time for public comment. <laughs> okay. I, I, I didn't. I was not ignoring okay. the phone call. Yeah. Uh, I was just waiting for the follow up Please. meeting. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll work see. with you on that one. Yeah. We'll, what the we'll committee was going to say. We'll make sure you get in touch. The most important thing to, to note is, in, with all the work we have to do to increase the parking count on the site, the incremental pieces here, mm -hmm. it doesn't add much to the cost. Yeah. Which is why it's, it's easy for us to say yes to a lot of these things, because if, if we can do it, it makes no sense not to do it. Sure. All right. Um, so uh, next exhibit. Um, you had asked to add some additional lighting for the enter and exit drive aisles. Um, there are, we've added lights, um, wall packs here and here uh, that are supposed to take care of that so that you have on the entry and the exit areas additional lighting which you had requested. Um, and those are, the types of lights are detailed uh, that light just on the left there, KAXW, is the, is the wall pack that you'll see there. Those are also on the rear of the building. Uh, and then you have two lights on poles in the rear of the parking lot there. 
uh, upper left is where that light is shown as well. Um, so, so that's what we've done on the lighting. So on the photometrics you got there, everything's up. Well, it's about 4.5, right? I think that's right. And it's all dark sky compliant. There's supposed to be, a, there may be a little spillover onto the sidewalk, which nobody seemed to have a problem with last time. No. Uh, so that's it. Yeah, as long as you're not spilling into the neighbor's yards yep. or houses. Yep. So okay. Um, <clears throat> you had asked for a lead checklist, which is Exhibit C. Um, I think that right there. Yeah, sorry for, this, for the size issue. Um, I'm going to go now. The next one was you wanted more of a narrative on how medical customers will be served versus recreational customers. Um, and, and we provided you a narrative on how that works, but I'll give you sort of some of the highlights. Um, first of all, uh, medical customers, it, to the extent that you are in a situation where they're, you, you have separate lines as they come into the facility for the two. And to the extent that you have a significant number of people, medical uh, patients get priority uh, in treatment. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, state regulations require that we have a separation. Um, we can probably show you the floor plan at some point, but there's, you basically have point of sale stations and then there's a separator between, there's one that's dedicated to medical and we have that uh, on the floor plan there. Other than that, what, what's required is that it's, you're virtually separated. In other words, every product that we have in this uh, facility is tracked um, by it, it, the inventory tracking system. It's called BioTrack, and it's separated that way. This is medical. Uh, this is recreational. So at checkout, you know, somebody is, what they're getting when they come up and say, I need, this is for my, here's my medical card, and I'm looking for this they're getting the medical product. It happens to be the same product in most cases, okay? Um, if, for example, you were to end up in a situation where we had a significant number of medical patients uh, who uh, took up all of the medical inventory, we could actually, through this inventory tracking system, we're allowed to switch over product, adult use recreational product, into the medical program right at the point of sale. Um, it's all done electronically. so. We won't be in a situation where we run out of any kind of uh, product for medical patients. Unless we also run out of it for recreational patients. If there's just none in the store, there's none in the store. Yes. <laughs> um, beyond that, there's also a separate consultation room in the facility, just like there is in the current medical facility where if a patient wants to have a consultation. A private uh, one, one Yeah, they can have that. Okay. Um, the next two items were a transportation demand management plan and a queuing and parking management plan. Um, so, and we've, we've provided those, uh, those plans here. And I'll, I'll try to give you some of the highlights. And, and I will say this as well about this. Um, we did sit down with uh, the police department and we're actually setting up uh, a time for them to come up and see the Lynn operation because you really do sort of have to see how this works to understand why this is going to work. Um, we've used numbers in trying to come up with, um, you know, the traffic impact statement where we say you're going to have turnover every 15 minutes of a patient. He's doing every seven minutes, and in fact, so are the rest of the facilities in Massachusetts. Uh, it's just much quicker is, is the way it's going. Can I ask just a point of question about sure. the number of turnover? I believe the last time you were in, you were quoting four. My, that, that, that's where I am. I like to say under seven. Okay, but, but now we're to 15 for this purpose. Yeah, for this purpose, we're, we, we've always been at 15 to 20 minutes in, uh, in the documentation. Okay. We are hovering around that four minute mark. I like to say under seven just to give myself a little room. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So, um, so uh, and, and what, we've, uh, what we agreed at the last meeting, and again, we'll sort of fine tune this as they see how this operation works, is um, we will be doing a, a memorandum of understanding. I think it was Mr. Heim that suggested it. So that to the extent that we end up in a situation where there is just enormous demand uh, that was unanticipated, we would have a, a uh, protocol set up with the police chief where we, if we had to go to some other ways of, uh, of lessening demand, that's what we're trying to do with this memorandum of understanding and saying, you know, whether it be that we need to uh, put certain uh, statements out on our website uh, to discourage people from coming at certain times or 
even if we needed to do some appointments, that sort of thing. We, we have all of that in, in a, a memorandum of understanding with the police so that, you know, they can come to us and say, we're, we're seeing a problem here, we need to do something about it. We want it in writing, we want a procedure established. Um, it, it just makes sense from everybody's perspective, and the, uh, the officers that we met with were comfortable with it, so that's what we're going to try to develop, but we want them to see uh, what's going on in Lynn um, so that they can have an understanding of how this really works, and I think it's easier to develop the plan once they see that. No, and, and just to add to that, I think that the coordination between us and the Arlington PD is going to be insanely valuable and important. Um, when we were launching in Lynn, it wasn't just a, a silo that we launched in sent out a notice. We coordinated that very closely with both state police and uh, local Lynn police to make sure that we all came up with a game plan. We even picked our launch date together um, and, you know, it delayed it from three days to seven days because that's what they wanted. Uh, and so we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to work closely with PD and make sure that we're in constant communication with them leading up to the launch and post-launch to make sure that they're comfortable with how everything's going um, and also on busy days. So we could project April 20th will always be a busy day. That's something that we'll be coordinating along with APD as well. Um, some of the other highlights of the, of the plan, we are going to, uh, we'll be putting this out on the website, that there will be shuttle service that we'll have, uh, both from Arlington Center and Lexington Center, so that if people want to take advantage of it, or uh, in the event that, for example, we just get uh, too many people and we have to turn people away, we can say to them, here's where you can go, you can take a shuttle uh, from there, that's available to you. So we will have that. Um, again, that's part of this sort of opening plan for the first month of operation. Whether we need it beyond that, again, I think we'll deal with that in this memorandum of understanding how we can say, yeah, we need to go back to that. Those That possibility is also available there. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, most of what what the, the plan is, it involves having parking attendants who are going to basically uh, explain to people, yeah, there's a space for you, go ahead, making sure people aren't lingering in the lots, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's how basically all of the dispensaries in Massachusetts have been handling, uh, especially the opening one month period where people sort of come out of curiosity and then, um, you know, d don't quite know what to do. Once you establish the protocol, uh, we found that everybody's doing it, and all of these opening day procedures that we're doing, they've been abandoned in just about every instance for all these other dispensaries because uh, people figure it out, and as, as I think I mentioned the last time, there's just a lot more of these opening up now. So uh, hopefully that's going to take care of, of any demand issues. Um, we also have a, a queuing system where, to the extent that we have so many people uh, that are in the facility. We're going to queue people in the interior. There'll be no exterior queuing here. Uh, once we get within five people of capacity, then what we go to is a system where we basically would be handing out, it's almost like a restaurant reservation system that says, here's, uh, you know, give, give us your cell phone number and we will contact you when we're available, uh, when, when you can come back and we would send people. Again, you, your choice is to go. You can take the shuttle or you can do what you need to do, but we'll let you know when there's a space for you. Again, I don't really see, based upon the turnaround times, that that's going to be necessary, but it is at, out there just in case there's this extremely high demand. Um, beyond that, there were a couple of other things that you mentioned. If we can go back um, to Exhibit B, that, that first site plan, that's the one. Um, uh, we did... We did add bike racks. Um, yeah, there they are. They're, they're right up here. There's two bike racks. You have the ability uh, to, to have four bicycles there. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we have the speed bumps, one going out, one coming in up here. Uh, and there's also pedestrian alert signs. There's one here on the building, um, and there's another one right over here. These are flashing. They, I think uh, there's a laser sensor when the car comes by. They will flash so that any pedestrians out there see uh, that there's an alert, that there's a car coming. Um, so those are uh, some of the highlights of um, the plans that we've done. The other um, thing that you had mentioned, uh, this traffic impact statement, and as I mentioned, I just gave you something I don't expect you to to read it, but I'm going to try and hit the details, the highlights. There were 
some questions raised about it. I think the staff wanted us to use some other estimates other than the ITE estimates that we had been using. Um, and so what we tried to do that, and summarizing it, the civil engineer wrote this out to me. You do see additional vehicles uh, at this site from its present use. Um, it's approximately uh, 142 more on a daily basis, 17 more at the a.m. peak hour, um, 30 more at the p.m. peak hour, and about 150 more on a Saturday. Um, what he was explaining to me is that um, the actual counts performed by the Arlington Traffic Advisory Committee indicate 666 vehicle pass, vehicles pass the site in the peak hour. Um, and then he explained that typically a two-way two roadway will handle 3,200 passenger cars. That's the roadway capacity. So what they do to determine level of service, you take the number of vehicles in the peak hour, 666, divide by the capacity, 3,200, and you get a ratio that determines level of service. The existing ratio right now is 20.8%. It's going to go up to 21.7%. The typical range uh, for a two-lane highway segment is between 16 to 32 percent for level of service C. So we're right in the middle of it. We're not even on the upper boundary, um, and and it's barely going up, less than one percent. Uh, so the traffic conditions, what he's saying is, it's just not going to be adversely affected by the use. Um, and uh, so that that summarizes that. You're welcome to read through it, um, but. Uh, we're open to any questions, comments, uh, anything else? Um, start down at the other end of the table, Rachel. Okay. Uh, while we're on parking, I just have two parking questions. Um, one I think you had addressed, I, I believe <coughs> in the materials you mentioned that you had agreed that at no time there would be any um, double parking on, on Mass Ave, which was a question that we had had previously. Right. I know you can't speak to the specifics around drop-offs and mm -hmm. pickups, but I just wanted to confirm. Yeah. That was the case. Okay. And then I saw a mention about Uber and Lyft drop offs and that you would be routing them through the parking area. Yeah. Is that correct? Can you just speak a little bit to how that will there, there's just gonna there's gonna be a designated area. Okay. And again the 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 uh, attendants will know where that is and so they can direct the car uh, to that area for drop offs. Um, so if they notice somebody idling out front, will they approach them? How how would how are you Yeah, I mean the, the idea is is that we're trying to you know, we're we're trying to have these people out, so they're seeing what's going on on Mass mm -hmm. Ave. Where you know, if somebody's standing, especially at that entrance, mm -hmm. you know, we'd rather they come in and drive through. If anything else, if right. they want to ask a question or something, so that's what they would be doing. Okay, so if somebody's waiting for an Uber or Lyft, you're going to direct them to that area um, uh, by the by the transformer. Is that where you're going to have them them wait to pick up, or on the other side? Which area? Uh, by the transformer on the on the left hand side of the building is where we're Uh No, well on the on the sidewalk yeah. there, but yeah. Oh yeah, so they were they were coming here. Ideally, the Uber or Lyft would come in through here, quickly pick them up, and be yep. off. Okay. Um, can we go back to the facade, the um, the new right there? Sure. Um, so I just wanted some more. Detail here. This isn't quite as much detail as I was hoping to see. Quite, quite frankly, um, mm -hmm. I see that you've moved the entrance before it was over. I think where the sign is is mm -hmm. now. Um, you had mentioned before that there was some existing wood on the facade that you were going to be removing or replacing or Re repainting and making it look all fresh and new, and also pressure washing the rest of the building. So I think one of the things that isn't here. There's no coloration of anything that you're planning to do. So if you're going to paint it, we want to know what you're painting it. And the same thing with the, the logo. I'm actually disappointed to see that, you know, before when we spoke, you had talked about this being a, a um, I think it was a laser jet metal that was backlit, and now this is a, a vinyl. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the vinyl is prohibited from being a sign that you just apply to the face of a, of a building. So I'm a bit concerned about the vinyl. I don't think that it's an appropriate sign. So we, type. regulatorily, we have to put vinyl on all windows. I understand that's something else I'll come to, but I'm, I'm talking about mm -hmm. the building sign in itself, because there is an actual sign band on this, on this building that currently is used for signage, that was meant for signage for this building, as well as, you know, the, the wall, if you wanted to employ a wall sign. And um, 
Are you referring to that area above the windows? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is where currently both Swifty as well as it's one of the signs. Of, you know, it's just right here on the on the photo. Um, what I'll refer you to that that it is a sign, mm -hmm. a sign band, and um, I I don't think that vinyl is an appropriate signage type that we want to be encouraging in the in the heights and or quite frankly anywhere in, in Arlington and I, I encourage you to look at the sign band and the wall and something more akin to what you were proposing previously. I'm okay with as that. As opposed to this sign. That's fine. Yeah that's that's I'm fine saying yes to that right now. Okay. That's what I, what I prefer. We thought this would be better received but yeah I actually prefer the I mean I'll, I'll leave that to my other colleagues to, to speak totally to agree with each other. Right. Perfect. Yeah. <coughs> no, okay. no, a vinyl sign is totally out of character of all the rest of the signs in the heights there. If you can put your sign that looks more like a t typical sign that mm -hmm. you find in the neighborhood uh, in the areas that she has mentioned it would be much better. Absolutely. Uh, it's somewhat backlit and it's metal something like a little more traditional signage. Um, yes you do have a vinyl requirement of screening the interior, but you, that just could be a, mm -hmm. a frosting or a pattern or whatever you guys choose to. Uh, I actually prefer the steel cut sign, so I thought that this was going to be preferred, but yes, I'm okay. much happier with the steel cut sign. Okay, great. So <laughs> you want to see again a, a, a detail on what size and, and where exactly you're going to put that. Okay. And then um, going back to the, 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 the discussion about the vinyl, I understand that you need to mm -hmm. um, obscure the view into the, the sales area. And then obviously, I believe from the most recent plan, the break room is on the right hand side as we're looking at this facade. I'm, I'm concerned about just using a flat, opaque, white, black, whatever color you're going to use for your, for your vinyl. I, I think that again, this is an area where we're trying to continue to encourage more, more traffic. Uh, foot traffic, pedestrian traffic, and for people to really think about the um, facades of their of their of their um, of their retail locations, um, and I I encourage you to look at a vinyl that's either if you're going to use vinyl to obscure to to look at either a pattern or or some sort of an art artistic. I know that you can't show your product mm -hmm. or talk specifically about what you're doing, but there are plenty of um, graphic options that are not just a plain, flat, opaque, single color that's going to um, enhance the, the block as opposed to make it look like something is, is closed and, you know, th yep. there, are, there, are, there are other options for you to look at mm -hmm. and um, a lot of other dispensaries have been very creative with what they're, what they're able to do to, to still contribute to the graphic nature of the, of the block. So I'd encourage you to, to do that as well and I think we you know just want to see what you're what you're looking at because that is part of the the facade. Sure. Right. And what one of my goals also with whatever we do put on the windows is to let in as much light as possible. Mm -hmm. So I want when, when you're inside a lot of light in there. I love natural light. I think that's and I think that's wonderful and again to go back to the lead checklist that kind of daylighting is something that's mm -hmm. very important. Um, so again I, I think it would be helpful for us to understand again with that in in mind um, what you're what you're thinking about doing. Uh, one important thing also is for these windows up here. Mm -hmm. There we don't have to obscure, so Absolutely. there there will be nothing. Perfect. Uh, just but a lot it's, of it's the it's yeah, you know, the, again the, the thinking about the pedestrian one. character as you're walking through that. It's a little deadly again when we're you know we're investing in the Arlington Heights orientation plan. There's a there's a lot of. Um, interest in, in really improving the, the reason for your day. Sure. And, and I can tell you that as, as a business owner, I would want it to look as nice as possible. We have all these restrictions, but I do want it to be as nice as we can make it. Okay. Great. Great. And then just while we're on signage, um, at the last meeting we talked about the fact that you were going to sign that it was Apotheca-only parking behind. So do you have, I think we, we need to see, a, again, a, a sign detail for that as well. Okay. As part of your package. Um, all right, Gene. That's it. I'll start with the front. So the two doors for the ATM and for your facility are going to be next to each other? Yes. How does one walk up and identify which one is which one? Um, we, would ha we will have our own staff outside the door. No, on ours. no sign? Um, and yeah, our sign will be above. I, I would imagine the steel cut sign will put it right above the uh, right above the, the door. All right, so that's another thing I think mm -hmm. you would want to see. Yeah. But 
how that would look like. I, I don't recall there being a, a street number on the building. Do you know if there is? I don't recall some of I looked at the building the other day. Would you put a number on the building too if there isn't one there? Yeah, we could pull one in. That's easy enough. So you have a different interior. We did. We did right, yeah. review than before. Correct. Can, can you walk us through yeah. how somebody comes in, goes through the facility? Absolutely. Uh, where they queue up inside if there's a line, things like that. Absolutely. So, just the overall flow first is in to the dispensary and then exit through here. So this will be an exit only door. So like that's a one-way traffic. That's right. the same. As yeah, so that's the same as before. Um, here you have the point of sale counters. This is the medical only one. There's actually a column right here. That's the separator. Yeah, so that the, the column acts as a natural separator for us, which is nice. Um, back here is the patient consultation room. And here is the vault room and employee break room. And here's the receptionist. So basically, when a customer comes in, we have stanchions in here to, to queue them. Uh, so it's just a simple queuing system of using stanchions like in an airport. They get checked in here. The process to check a customer in takes about five seconds. We have a visual check and then a secondary uh, machine check on, on every ID. And then they come into the actual dispensing floor. In here, you have different display cases. Uh, we'll play around with the actual queuing system. But basically, once you finish looking at the displays, where all the product is se uh, sealed, locked, and secured to the displays, then there's another stanchion queuing system that will take them to the registers and then they leave. Other than the stanchions inside the entrance, is there any physical separation now between the entryway and the display area? Yeah, so this right here is a wall. Huh. So ex a wall. I'm not There's clear on the flow then. So when, you, you, when you come in, you check in here, and then you let into the dispensary floor here. And then if you wanted to be in a patient, if you want to go to the patient consultation room or go back here, you would enter in through back here. So this is this is separated from the entryway. So how how do you where where is the entrance through that wall that separates it? I it's not clear to me from that drawing. I don't, I don't see the actual door here. I'm sorry, but um, let me see. <coughs> the dash line you're referring to, I think, is the skylight above yeah. the open yeah. space. I'm gonna have to get you a, a better answer. I'm sorry. We'll have to yeah. There there is a there's a, a wall that's going in here though. Um, that would be that would be blocking access and yeah I I don't see the actual door here so I apologize for and that. Is that is that a requirement because in the original design you had kind of a sh a chicane and a second door so it was kind of like a sally port that's set up. So it is a requirement. So basically, when someone walks in from here before they're allowed into this area, they have to be checked, um, and so that has to be a physical separation from here to here. That's a requirement. We'll we'll revise. And show you. How many people can be queued up in that space between the entrance door and the check-in desk? Here we could fit about 15 people. 15? Yeah. And then on the floor, a lot more. Because there's the displays of our customers like the browser at their own leisure. <coughs> and then there'll be the queue line into the actual POS. And then we also have order ahead using an app called Leafly. Um, so people are able to also order ahead and just quickly go pick up the product they need. I was happy to see the outdoor bicycle racks, although I think you take a look at what our bicycle guidelines are for what would be appropriate racks and what would be inappropriate racks. To use, do you have any indoor bicycle storage? We were going to be putting into the break room. So within the break room we'll, ha we'll have uh, two bicycle. Okay. Uh, that, capacity. That'd be good, but again, we would need to see that. Okay. And, and see what that is actually going to be. Okay. For the bicycles there. Um, it's it's a little hard for me to comment on the traffic impact statement since we just got it a little while ago, and I was trying to thumb through it, but not pay, and pay attention at the same time, which is tough to do. Can can you just talk a little bit about of all the facilities in Massachusetts, which have the highest number of people coming in in each hour? Yep. And is that the number that's being used in this traffic study? It, it's not. The highest is uh, Brookline, uh, NETA. We do give you the numbers in mm -hmm. here. Um, 
And the reason it's the highest is because it's the only recreational place in Boston. And that's who it's serving right now, is the entirety of Boston. Um, what we did, I think, is choose something. It's something between that and there was a, a group called SPAC Consulting, which your staff told us, use those because they're a little higher than ITE. So we chose something in between. I think we used something in between SPAC Consulting and uh, that Brookline facility. Um, there's no place in America that's seen what uh, that Brookline facility is seeing, and so we don't. We just can't uh, assume that that's what you're going to see here. It's an anomaly across the entire country. The Brookline facility is also what, three times the size of that footprint here. It is bigger, although it has no parking. <laughs> so it has. I think it has four spaces. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, but I'm talking about the sales floor itself. Yes. Yes. It's quite, quite large, right? Yes. yes. It's the yes. former Brookline Savings and Loans Bank building. Yeah, cool. Go on that bank. <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, it, how many square feet are you here? About 1,800. Yeah, I, it, it's probably uh, 600, 700 square feet more. Oh, only twice? What's that? About well, twice. Less than twice, because they're a little over 2,000. So. Yeah, it's, it's bigger. I just remember seeing that bank being... They have a lot of bank alphas there. Really, really big. And I've been to the the, well, the outside, if you look at the outside, but the sales floor itself is not the entirety. So, Like like our, our building in Lynn, for example, is a 4,600 square foot building. Our actual um, dispensing floor is like 1,200 feet of that. What concerns me about not using the Brookline number yep. is that you may end up, and we may end up with an undercount because this will be the first facility west of Boston and we'll probably get people coming, I would guess, and probably hope they will, from not only Arlington, but Lexington and Belmont, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's a mistake. I mean, it's fine if you want to use these numbers, but I think you need to run a second set of numbers, which are the Brookline numbers, so we can see if, if you end up at the Brookline numbers, here's what it's going to be. And here's what you're going to do. If these are the numbers that you end up with, here's what it is, and here's what you're going to do. So I would like to see it, this run again. I, I hear you. And we did. We weren't trying to hide it. That's why we did put it in there. I think, mm -hmm. obviously, if you end up in that situation, um, you know, with a Brookline scenario, you're going to have to, that's when we're talking about this memorandum of understanding. We're going to have to go to some sort of a different system than just what we well, have I, here. I, I want to see what that is before <laughs> I would take a vote on your permit. Right. You know? And the impact on, at, uh, with the Brookline numbers on the intersection of Mass Ave and Park Avenue, and the impact on Paul Revere Road. It's, I, I don't know if you put that in here for the current numbers, but I would really like it to be in here for both sets of numbers so we, you can take a look at two, sure. uh, two options. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you do have those Salem and Brookline averaged. For right. Correct. Together. Right. right. And then separately, your Lynn facility. Yep. Against the other. Yep. And I think it is using an average, maybe. I don't know. I'd be more appropriate. Well, okay. I don't know. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I would like to see the peak up on them. so we get an idea about the worst case. The worst case. Yeah. What's the worst and, case? And, and what would happen? If, if we had the worst case, and then what you would do if you had that for some period of time. Um, and if there is going to be a memorandum of understanding, it would be helpful for us to know what's going to be in that and, and what it's going to be like. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can't say more about the traffic study because I haven't obviously had time to read through um, the entire study. The, I guess the other, and this is more like an observation, having gone by a few times. It's, I think it's going to be very difficult for the cars to exit the parking lot because it's sort of a straight out, and then they're going to have to make a 90 degree right turn, and there's a parking space right up against the area where the driveway is, and I wondered if you'd talk to the town about getting that parking space removed to no parking there. I think it would be a lot easier for people to exit the parking lot 
if that space weren't there. So you may take a look at that. You may not agree with me, but when I've gone by, I thought that would help a lot. I, I, I don't think we have a problem with it. If yeah. the, the question would be if... Well, talk if, to the town yeah. then about the possibility of doing that and see what they think. Okay. What they think about it. Okay. Um, I guess the other thing I'll say about traffic, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of traffic up and down Mass Ave in Arlington, so wherever a facility is going to be located, there's going to be traffic, and traffic's going to have to be dealt with. But my concern is, at this specific location, with the traffic count, with the street behind, with the parking, we need to get very specific and use the Brookline number so we have the worst case scenario possibility as well as what you consider the more likely possibility so we can compare the two. I, I, and I'm happy to give you the exact numbers. Uh, I, I just, I study. guess what my concern is, is that we're sort of looking at, we're looking at two things in a vacuum here. We're looking at it as though there will never be another dispensary in Arlington and there will never be another dispensary in Boston, both of which I think aren't the case. So I'll give you the numbers and we can try to do that, but I do, I do want everybody to understand, we are, within a year, you're going to see twice the number of dispensaries in the state than you have right now. So, um, so we, you may be dealing with it for a year, yeah. we may be dealing with it for a year, and we need to know what that's going to be like. No for question. Next year. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the potential. Like. Yes, yep. thank you. Yep. So those are my comments. Sure. David. Um, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the inclusion of bike parking, and just to be more specific, uh, if you haven't already looked at the town's new bicycle parking guide for the specifics of uh, preferred bike racks and uh, how and where to install them, um, I highly recommend that, and if that isn't enough guidance, then uh, the, the planning department would be happy to, to further assist you. Um, uh, I, I think um, you, if it's at all possible, you should uh, try to provide more exterior bike parking beyond the two racks that you were proposing, if there's space for it. Um, you know, I, I realize there aren't a lot of options around the property, and that's that's a pretty good location where where you've got them sited. But uh, if if there is space to uh, use a higher density solution there. Um, that would that would be good because that would allow uh, for more more bicycle use. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, um, I uh, was happy to see in your in your TDM plan um, the proposal to uh, do a T pass subsidy um, and uh, appreciate that. Um, uh, also. Uh, uh, with the addition of the break room, you're able to provide lockers. And it looked to me on the plan, there was also a place to wash up mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, there's going to be a, there's already plumbing into that space, so a sink and there's going to be a little cabinet, fridge, and microwave for our employees. Okay. Um, I mean, ideally, uh, um, a shower would be nice, but again, we won't be able to pull that off. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know space is limited. Space is uh, limited. But uh, having been a bike commuter in the summer I, I, and worked in an office without a shower, um, you have to get creative. Uh, we can uh, put out some, some cologne and perfume. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, I. I do like the other aspects of, of the TDM plan, uh, informing employees of the options, providing information to customers about transportation options. I, I realize you're, you're extremely limited in the amount of, of, um, of communication you can do about the business, mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, definitely appreciate uh, to the extent that you are able um, uh, making transportation information um, very prominent and widely available to the customers so that they understand they don't have to drive there. Now, the three avenues that we use we mostly be able to communicate, well four really, it's our own website, uh, we have an email list that has continued to grow every single month. Um, we are able to put that information on the weekly app, which is a dispensary finding tool, and on our Google Maps listing will be coming there as well. Those are the four key ways that we communicate. Yeah. 
Um, one thing I, I might ask you to add, because I, I don't think it was in here, is, is actually doing some monitoring and data collection on how people actually are getting to the dispensary, mm -hmm. um, bo both employees and customers, um, and, uh, and perhaps reporting that to the town. Uh, um, regularly, and perhaps annually, if that's appropriate. Yeah, we do annual reports to the town. Yeah. So yeah. So that could just be included in, in the report. Yeah, we'll pick kind of like a TV sweeps week and do statistical analysis during that period. <laughs> Great. Well, employees are easier. Employees are easier because we just have to ask them, "Hey, what? Are, how are you getting here?" Yeah. Um, with customers, you know, we'll be able to obviously model that out, and we could include it in our annual reports. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, you look, I had one thing I meant to ask. Uh, the material talked about the employees being able to park in the sunrise. Mm -hmm. the parking lot, are you going to have a memorandum of understanding or agreement with them, something in writing that we'll be able to see that memorializes that? That's, that's already part of a separate environmental design review special permit with Sunrise as employee parking for people in the district. That's what we're talking about. So, so that already, that exists. already exists yes. and Sunrise will be required That is already to allow. required. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, that, that's for all businesses in the business district? Technically, yes. Mm -hmm. no. Actually, <clears throat> one of the points that I wanted to make, and I'll just jump in here, is how you plan to handle any parking <coughs> Any of your customers parking in the business and butter lots? I think there's some concern about those business mm -hmm. owners that your customers are going to be taking up their spots. They want to be sure that that's not happening. And how do you plan to enforce that? So we'll have our park attendants watching those kinds of things as customers leave. We can see where they're physically going. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's any issues, um, one call away, one email away, one text away, and I will have my security staff respond. Okay. I think the issue is when they park, not when they're leaving. Mm -hmm. Maybe we want to make sure that. Well, the <laughs> important thing is we catch it when it's happening, and yeah. we continuously inform our customers not mm -hmm. to do it. And that could that's also going to be one of the things that could be included in that first intake process. Yeah. Okay. Just like don't park on Paul Revere. Yeah, don't park on Paul Revere. Don't <laughs> park in the exactly. neighbor's uh, lot. Okay. Just following up on something Jean asked about, um, which is the, the poor sight lines for uh, drivers exiting the parking lot. Um, um, while you're thinking about um, how, to, how to deal with that, uh, I think longer term, it would be good to um, monitor um, how people are doing being able to get out of the lot and make right turns and perhaps even more difficult left turns. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, just um, get a sense of if it's problematic. Um, and uh, then at some future time, if, if it turns out that it is very difficult uh, to get out of there, uh, there may have to be some future discussion of, of finding a, a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. But it would be good. Uh, among the other data points that you're collecting, just to also monitor that. Yeah. Yep. Jenny, you have one for me. Go ahead. Just on the point of parking in other, potentially parking in other people's private lots, the NETA facility actually provides those sandwich boards and puts them out throughout along Boylston Street and in the neighborhood to make it clear that there's no public consumption and also no public parking or any any parking related <coughs> to that facility. So would you consider something along those oh, lines? Oh, absolutely. Similarly, because I think that that would be an effective absolutely. You know, call to people to not do those things. Yeah, if, if those we're those allowed to put those way. out yeah. in those oh. areas. Well, well, I'll speak with Riley about yeah. putting yeah. that in, on the, at least their property. Yeah. 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 We'll, uh, we'll interest that. in that, but I would okay. think they would. Yeah. Sure. Public consumption is the other part to that message. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I will. I will look closely at, at the additional traffic information, but of course, I haven't had a chance to, to dig into it. Yet. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for addressing our concerns about site drainage. Uh, appreciate that, and also um, site lighting, uh, increasing the lighting back there, and. 
echo my the same concerns as Rachel has with the signage. I think we're not going to go back. You know, we, yeah. I think it, uh, you, if you address that, that'd be great. Um, and then um, having an update floor plan where there shows the interior vestibule that you talked about. Yeah. Uh, showing more of the controls. Perfect. Well, while you do that also, um, I know it's not really meant to, but we just we just mentioned I think it's a nice start is uh, gender neutral bathrooms. We're just gonna we had talked about it last time, mm -hmm. saying that just say toilet room, mm -hmm. call it a day. You know, it's only single occupancy, so yeah, it, it makes all the sense in the world. You know, not the limit. Uh, and then uh, I just want to touch base a little bit on your break room. Does that need to be fully screened? Yes. It still does? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Then. I would very much like for it to be open as well. No, I didn't say open, open, but I'm saying you know, maybe it's, it's a, it, it sort of filters down a little bit where it opens up more where you, where you actually can see in and out a little bit, you know? I, just to, just to I liven wish. up a little bit, you know? I, believe me, I wish. <laughs> but if it right, right now we're adding a new break room in our cultivation facility, and it's, in, it's an interior break room. And one entire wall, we just made it into a window into the rest of the facility, just so it seems bigger. I would much rather have that if I would be allowed, but I'm not. Then uh, no, I'll just leave it. Uh, I'll, I don't have the same concerns with uh, the pulling out as much because I've looked at that before when I was doing my survey thing. The buses seem to come in and out of there in, at all sorts of times. They don't have any. They don't have any issues with um, uh, traffic. Maybe because it's a huge yellow bus and we just get out of their way, but I just see them coming and going, not really an issue with that. They turn around right across the street. So, I don't know. I, I just well, there's also parking prohibited in front of the. Uh, the yeah, but I'm, talk, I'm just talking about just coming out yeah. and then merging with traffic. It seems right. like there's no, you know, it doesn't seem to be an issue. Yeah. Yeah, there may yeah. there may not yeah. there may not be from a traffic perspective, but the sight line issue is different for buses because they're up above and and there's no parking yeah. right in front of the busway. Anyway. This this one gives the point of view as well. <laughs> uh, and then um, is there any way of adding a little more lighting to the front to make it a little warmer? I mean, when you look at this concrete building, it's concrete and glass. It's just the style it was back then. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the nature of the rest of the uh, the heights, it's 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 more brick and storefront, and it, it's a little warmer. Mm -hmm. um, you don't show any vegetation up front, right? Um, no, we're not because we don't have any space on yes. the property for that. So I don't know. And you're painting everything just solid colors. There's no like, natural wood, or you can apply some wood trim. To, it's just something to warm it up a little bit, just to give well, it a little. There is that wood trim. It just looks super faded. So we want to go back to what that original color looked like on it. I so you're going to paint it a, a brown or are you going to stain it? Stain it, I think. Is, okay. Is what so I think construction guy wants to do. To Ken's point, I think that's just what we would want to see what what you're proposing mm -hmm. okay. to look like. And I think that's a good choice to, to go stain. Yeah, just somehow just a warm up. It's, it's very, yeah. it, it's, it looks like a prayer looks like a prison or something, you know? <laughs> Concrete and glass. A, 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 little, a little former Soviet Union. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was a style back then. It, it yeah. was definitely a style back in the 60s. <laughs> yep. you know, uh, but if we just warm it up a little bit, I, I, I think it'd be much appreciative. Okay. You know, and that's, that's really all I have. Okay. Good. I think most of my concerns were, were answered. So unless anyone else has anything, I'll open it up to public comment. I do appreciate you providing everything you did provide. I know we've given you another list of homework to come back <laughs> with. Show me a few more items here. Uh, I will open it up for public comment. Please raise your hand. I'll call on you, state your name and address and uh, address your comments in the board. If I want to have the applicant answer the question, or the department answer the question, I will do so. so uh, anyone wish to speak? All right. Seeing none, I'll turn it back to the board. It looks like we have. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I missed the beginning part, so I don't know if there was a follow-up in terms of rat management and pest management. Yeah, can you just state your name and ask? Oh, sure. So just Sutton Rockwood, 71 Paul Revere. Thank you. Right behind it. Go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. Oh, so, um, yeah, that, that is something I actually brought up. Um, we, we're we're going to be working with an extermination company to make sure that at, before we take out anything there, that gets taken care of, because I wouldn't want any rats running around either. So we got you covered. <laughs> 
Okay. Anyone else wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. Laura Larkin, 70 Polar Bear Road, and this is a question more for the town, and I'm wondering if it's possible for you to do um, a count of what the traffic currently is on Paul Revere, and then um, be able to compare that to after the facility opens. Do we have those numbers? Um, I don't think we have numbers for Paul Revere Road, but I can check on that and report back to this board. Okay. Um, and then the after, of course, that, that's a different count. Mm -hmm. All right. Unless anyone else wishes to speak, uh, I think I'll close public comment for now. You can always submit questions, comments, concerns, and email to the board and to the staff. Uh, <coughs> and then I'll turn it to, to you folks. When do you think you would be ready to come back before us? I don't think there's a lot here. There's a bit much so probably yeah, wh whatever. Our next, our next actual meeting would be the 27th. Mm -hmm. Okay. January 27th. That's so, great. All right, so I'd take a motion to continue this hearing to January 27th. So motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so work with staff to get us everything in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Happy New Year. Year. Potential zoning by one amendments coming up, okay. uh, carrying on from December 7th. Yep, and this is really just a, a continuation of that conversation. I don't have anything new to provide. I provided a copy of my memo, which is the same memo that we were to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, I did not provide the other supplemental materials that I added to the agenda the night that we first talked about them, but if you wish to refer back to them, uh, two of them were related to the stormwater bylaw. And then the other one was from a resident, uh, Chris Loretti, who um, shared a couple of ideas, a few ideas, uh, proposed amendments. Um, so that I think that there are probably, you wanted to continue this conversation to talk about the things that this board wishes to pursue. There might be other folks in the room who have things to add that either residents are considering pursuing or they may ask the board to uh, reconsider certain items. So that's that's all that I wanted to offer for this evening. And of course you have another meeting on the 27th where you can continue this conversation and hopefully use that evening to finalize and um, vote on what you would like to file officially with the warrant. And that would be the warrant article language that we would then submit by the 31st, mm -hmm. which is the deadline. So glad to take any questions or if you want to continue the conversation that you started on the second, then we can go from there. I'll continue to question I know there's some people here that wish to speak in the public. I'll give them an opportunity to do so as well. If there are any comments from members of the board on what we've seen already, I think the idea is uh, <clears throat> to keep having discussions in the various subcommittees. Uh, we have our meeting with the select board next week, which is another agenda item this yes, evening, yes, yes, yes. Um, where we'll start to talk about future town meeting uh, zoning bylaw amendments, which will <coughs> largely revolve around the topic of housing. Uh, it sort of remains to be seen where that's going to go, depending on how next week's conversation goes. But uh, that won't be for a, a, a spring 2020 town meeting. It'll be fall 2020 special. If one happens, the earliest, more likely, uh, out into 2021, so we can get the proper uh, public participation and uh, community buy-in and a lot of those things that are, that are coming up. I think our April town meeting is going to be relatively quiet, uh, sort of by intention. I mean, basically, if you go back to my memo, the last last paragraph, the right? last paragraph, mm -hmm. or the the items that we I think most recently discussed, mm -hmm. and re that relate to zoning amendments. Can you just run us through those while I get caught up? Well, I had a question about just if you could run us through the eight point two. I think it was eight point two point two. Eight point two point two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and basically, it's just to update uh, what is. Technically, it was the a two year mm -hmm. period in special permits being valid is now a three year period. Mm -hmm. So it's really just an amendment to make okay. sure that it's in compliance with state law and allowing it. that two year to be three years. Um, the other one was def uh, de adding a definition of apartment conversion, which was not done during the recodification mm -hmm. effort but came up. Um, we also talked about uh, 
the landscaped and usable open space calculation to make sure it's clear that it's relative to the GFA first mm -hmm. floor area, which had been worded slightly differently and, and referenced slightly differently in the prior version of the zoning bylaw when it was recodified. We don't have that specific reference in the bylaw. Mm -hmm. um, so putting that back that way. The 5.2.2 .2 um, is essentially talking about what is allowed or not allowed. Currently, mm -hmm. the use table doesn't exactly say no, it is or is right. not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, so adding, adding mm -hmm. some things to that table as well in all of the related sections. Um, some administrative corrections with regard to, obviously, we have a select board, not a board of selectmen anymore. Um, there's an August date, but without the actual day noted. It says August and then the year. Right. We need exactly. to have the date. We have the date. Um, <coughs> correcting the citations to medical marijuana, which um, we have an incorrect citation in there. And then matching the new half-story definition um, correctly in a separate section under how we do essentially a uh, plan review. And uh, also correcting a, a citation to regulation in the billboard definition. So those are basically the things that, mm -hmm. in summary, we talked about the last time. And then I mentioned in my memo uh, a number of other initiatives and efforts that will eventually lead to potential zoning amendments, but not until a future town meeting. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I noted um, and that you expressed an interest in was the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which wouldn't be through this board, but would go to the select board, but that you are eventually interested in seeing what that will look like. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think there was anything else. Okay. Any questions? Go ahead, David. I had a couple of questions. Um, I, I've seen uh, some references that there is some discussion going on, although I wasn't clear whether it was just among a citizens group or it involved the town mm -hmm. on uh, exploring uh, the issue of prohibiting new gas connections. Fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and do you, do you have an update on that? Yes, my update on that is that the Clean Energy Future Committee um, had been discussing this as a town committee, but also Sustainable Arlington and Mothers Out Front has also been, have also been talking about it separately and then also sometimes together. So we had a follow-up from the Clean Energy Future Committee meeting that um, my staff will be, uh, and actually already has a handle on all of the language that was proposed for the Brookline Special Town Meeting this fall and that a subgroup from the Clean Energy Future Committee with the staff, as well as representatives from Mothers Out Front and Sustainable Arlington will be meeting to review those things and then go back to the Clean Energy Future Committee to discuss it again so that there can be something filed for town meeting in the spring. Um, that's the current, that's where we're at right now. We don't have the exact language. We don't have any, yeah. you know, specifics discussed. Brookline went through a whole process that included a number of exemptions uh, to make it clear that it wasn't, you know, completely prohibitive, but also to have a waiver process. And so I think that the same kind of thing will be talked about and explored here as it's being developed. And I'm certain that this board will be talking with that group of people once it's further evolved. Is that's that an, we'll just note that's that an AG's Jean, office, right? Jean was an attendee at that meeting in the audience huh. at the Clean Energy Future Committee. And um, so that that's just... And, just and the committee's note. meeting... Later this month, I've forgotten the exact date. They're with, now meeting. With this is the agenda item. Yeah, they're now going to meet on the 28th, I believe. Um, um, they moved, they, the, or the 29th, 29th. I, I apologize. Yeah, they had to move their meeting um, to a different day. And are they also discussing the uh, one of the other things you, you had brought up at a previous meeting, Gina, about uh, potentially requiring green roofs or okay. solarization? The water town. Yeah. Um, well, I've mentioned that to them, and they haven't seemed to be as responsive. I'm intending to email Ken Pruitt and ask him again if he'll add that to the agenda as another item. Okay. I believe they talked about it actually at that meeting quite a bit, and what they talked about was they're going to further vet that as part of their their net zero planning process. And there was there were some people who were very interested in what was being uh, discussed. It actually came up at the very end of the meeting when it was when it was raised so i think that there's some opportunity there but i think they also want to look at it as part of their broader net zero planning it, it, process i thought not to 
get into this too much. I thought there was a little bit of confusion between requiring actual solar on certain commercial buildings and just making them solar ready. And I don't think that distinction got sort of sorted out. At, at it wasn't meeting. an official agenda item. It was right. just raised right. as an idea at the end okay. of the meeting. So I think um, some follow-up was probably needed to further discuss that. The changes so in Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn, yeah. They, those changes that were made are now being discussed in the AG's office for legitimacy or? They were submitted to the Attorney General's office, yes. Yeah, they're under review now. Okay. I thought that's what we had talked about waiting to see what that came up to. I think the choice think is that we're going to <coughs> file something and that during that process we will be able to see what happens. A number of other municipalities are very interested in the same, same bylaw and actually mass clean, um, clean energy, clean doesn't sound right. Climate Action Network, yes. MCAN, and Mass, Mass Climate Action Network, um, has been gathering people throughout uh, the Commonwealth to learn more about this. They're having a meeting about it on January 12th, um, which will be broadcast. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities to learn more about what what this could be and what, what the next steps are for municipalities. So I, I'm very glad that this discussion is, is ongoing. Um, there was definitely both interest and confusion out in the public from what I saw about exactly what's being discussed and what the potential um, implications are um, for both new construction and existing homeowners. And um, um, somebody, I forget their name, um, but they seem very involved in the discussions, uh, posted some very detailed information mm -hmm. on the economics of w under what circumstances it might make sense to retrofit existing properties for uh, electric-based heating instead of fossil fuel heating. And I found that extremely helpful, you know, as, as someone who owns an older home with gas heating, um, in, in understanding um, whether it, it made economic sense and, and what the, the financial implications of making that conversion might be mm -hmm. uh, for me as a homeowner. So I, it would be good to, to make sure that, um, that that kind of information is easy to find mm -hmm. um, and, and is, uh, is getting out to the, to the public. You know, I, the proposal that I think they're talking about, if I understand it correctly, is for new construction. Yes, And for is. substantial renovation and not just for retrofit. Yeah. But I, I think there was concern uh, about whether it would uh, affect existing yeah. homes. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us who might be interested in, in doing it anyway, um, understanding the, the economics of it is complicated. Um, so a uh, couple of other things. Um, I did take note of Steve Revelak's um, memo um, regarding the open space definitions and I, I thought it was an interesting idea to distinguish between public open space and private open space mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't sure whether anyone else had thought thought about that at all and had any thoughts on the implications of it because I know it is something that uh, I think has been confusing in discussions of, of projects that we've had before mm -hmm. and and that I think has been confusing to the public mm -hmm. um, when, when we're talking about open space and I, I think um, there's so much interest in in creating and preserving open space here in Arlington that um, if, if this would help make those discussions more clear, um, I think it is something that, that we should consider doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I hope Steve, <coughs> who's usually He's, in attendance. He, he regrettably could not be here this evening. Okay. So, um, Could we have him here on the 27th I, I will, to talk about that? I will that let him know that you've asked okay. him to be yeah. here. And then the, the last thing was, and I think, I, I believe this is something else that Mr. Loretti had brought up previously, um, was um, do we need to look at clarifying um, uh, under uh, 
the mixed use bylaw, um, when, whether the uh, uses being considered for the mixed use building must be independently permissible in that district. Or is, or is it sufficiently clear as it stands? I'm satisfied with how it is currently. Um, <clears throat> it, I'm not in favor of putting any additional restrictions on that until, unless and until we are able to revise the zoning map as it exists, uh, take it into consideration at that point. Right now, the zoning map is what it is because <clears throat> it was just kind of put in place as a piecework, patchwork quilt. Uh, and tackling that, I think, is more important than taking on any other uh, restrictions on the zoning map until we, uh, until we can take care of that problem. I would agree. That was exactly my position on that request as well. Okay. I know that's something that the zoning bylaw <coughs> working group is still pursuing. I think putting that where it is now and then looking at the zoning map is paramount. It's something that has to be done sooner rather than later. Go ahead, Jim. So I think the um, potential zoning amendments in uh, Jenny's memo make sense, and I mm -hmm. wonder if we would want to ask the staff to actually draft the warrant articles to go along with each mm -hmm. one of yeah. those so we could so see them by the That's next what would meeting. come to the January 27th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Great. Yeah, yeah, you'll have that, that as a draft, sense. and then that okay. would be what we post. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think we've decided to move Five. forward on those, so that's, that's Great. fine. Okay. Anything else on those? <clears throat> no, that was all I had. Okay. Um, I we did get an email from Barbara Thornton earlier today. I think you were all copied on that. I know Jenny and I were. Yes. So Barbara, I'd have you come up and, and discuss yeah. your proposal, please. Sort of in the abstract. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Barbara Thornton. I'm uh, Precinct 16, uh, 223 Park Avenue in Arlington. And I have paper for you. Um, I spoke earlier uh, with Jenny, and she asked me to bring some copies of the uh, proposal, uh, the, the one that you're referring to, that you all received. So I have hard copies of that. Yeah, you presented this yesterday and let us know that you'd have hard copies. Did I let you know? You did let us know. Oh, Jenny, well, thank I you had you that. me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, when you can disperse it every whichever way. And I have three, I have three additional um, articles that I want to uh, bring to your attention that have to do with housing as well. Uh, I understand that it is your prerogative as a board to decide whether or not to go forward this season with the accessory uh, dwelling unit proposal. And I beseech you to uh, do that. Okay. Uh, we were very close last time. I think we were we missed it because there was some confusion. I think we can sort out the confusion. And what I have prepared here is a is a very simplified uh, proposal uh, to you with a warrant article that's derived from existing warrant articles from other comparable municipalities. Mm -hmm. So that the try and, and take the work away. But I think the the uh, purposes that I put in one, two, and three make it uh, clearer to the town meeting members and to the town mem residents as a whole why having accessory dwelling units as an option is such an important issue. And I think to put it into a more complicated zoning issue would be, it wouldn't hurt this, but it wouldn't help the zoning other. This, this kind of helps you kind of warm up the audience and slide in in the fall to more pure zoning issues. So, so we'll definitely, we will take a look at this. I think it would make more sense to have you back on the 27th. I think we've all had a good chance to get into to it and consider it. Um, I'll have Jenny reach out to you as far as what the board's considering. Okay. Um, continue, please. Just okay. Just letting you know how, how we... Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, summarize so I'm going to let you read that. The other, the other three articles that I'm proposing, and, and by I, I mean I'm the one that's here, but there are other people who are interested as well in proposing these. Uh, <coughs> the start with the 
uh, process to require speakers who are proponents or opponents of certain legislation to register in advance as such with the clerk and the moderator. And this is, this is uh, stolen from, let me do the same thing, just put these up here. This is stolen from the uh, town of Brookline. It pretty much is literally stolen from the town of Brookline. Right. Borrowed. <laughs> and I'm not giving it back. Uh, because they they found that when there are particularly contentious issues in town meeting, when there are a lot of people that want to speak on, on both sides, that the fairest way of making sure that there was a balance in, in hearing both sides for the rest of the town meeting members was to have people sign up in advance as either proponents or opponents and have the moderator decide, you know, one from this side, one from this side, alternately, so that you hear a balanced group of people. That allows, that is not only good for the town meeting members, it's not only good for the moderator in, in clarifying who, who comes up next, but it also helps those people who may be preparing uh, positions as a group or as a subgroup so that they know, I'm going to be speaking on this part of it, but I know you're coming up next, so you can speak on that part of it. Just makes the whole presentations much more organized, and I think Arlington is, is ready for that. Do you, do you know what, what the moderator's position is on this? No. I don't. You're seeing it for the first time. No, it's not something we would vote on anyway. It's no. For the select no, I board. Think, but. I think the, the reason for it is because of our experience at Springtown meeting, to be fair, um, mm -hmm. we did not have a balanced presentation at annual town meetings last year. I say that successfully. Um, and I think that um, when it's important, and especially as this board with the select board determines which, how you're going to move forward together with a new housing agenda that will eventually go to a town meeting, I think it will be important to make sure that we have those balanced points of view about how people view these different topics. So I, I do think it's important. That's the overlap to, to this board. I think it's okay. relevant and, 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 it, and also relates to the reordering of the agenda for a town meeting um, in terms of the order of articles. Um, so I think that there's, there's a couple of things that, do, that are important for you. You don't have to necessarily weigh in on them, but I think that mm -hmm. having measured conversation is helpful to everybody and also more equitable. And housing issues, as, as you know better than anyone, housing issues and zoning issues are contentious and complicated. And, and often require uh, visual uh, perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So when you can lay out, even the day before, you can, do, working with the, the moderator can work with, with Jenny, for example, or, or you all, and say, you know, are we making sure that we have the balanced uh, visuals that we need? Are we making sure that we have the details, explanations of how it relates to current zoning or how, what it's going to do for the town? from all of these proponents and opponents. So I think I wouldn't write that in. I wouldn't recommend writing that in. But I'm hoping, I know that's what happens in Brookline, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that will happen here. Um, any other questions on that? OK, moving forward to number three. Three. Uh, this is an article to propose the creation of a process allowing affordable housing to be built on uh, privately owned parcels of non-conforming size. I'm going to pass out. Hmm. That's um, another one I ask you to come back with some detail on the 27th. Okay, you want detail on this? Yes. Okay. On the 27th. Yes, but, oh. Okay, so this, uh, the purpose of this proposal is, um, it, and this is taken from a suggestion that, uh, to give him full credit, from it came from Steve McKenna. He drafted a, a, uh, an affordable housing approach. The town badly needs affordable housing. The town's zoning the way it exists. Apparently, there are a lot of parcels in town that are just a little bit too small in the uh, residential units to be able to build anything. But if you gave permission to to build on those with the proviso that, that anything that's built on that property is permanently affordable, either by rent or ownership, and, and you have the procedures in place to enforce that in perpetuity, uh, I think there would be a real interest in, in developing uh, more property. It, it opens up yet another opportunity in town to develop uh, affordable housing. Okay. So 
that's that. And last but not, I just oh yes, I'm sorry. I'd be real interested in hearing from the town council about whether this is consistent with the state zoning code. Because I don't know whether it would be or not. I haven't submitted this to right. town council right. yet, but will that be something? Should I just ask him specifically to yes. think about yes. that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So three for this side, one for me. This side. Okay. Last but not least, this is my personal favorite. So I just am I'm asking your indulgence. I'm, I may, uh, as you may or may not know, trained as a city planner and went to a school of architecture. And I am, so I, the idea of a design competition sponsored by Arlington would be a, a, a real joy to my heart. And I think it would be good for the town as well because you have just completed the work with the, um, the students on the Broadway corridor. And I found, I went to the presentation uh, that they did here, I, I found it to be very interesting. One of the big takeaways for me was how many uh, of those units that are now in the Broadway corridor area are actually uh, inhabited by one or two people. That tells me that there is a need for smaller units, single, fan, single or, or double occupant housing in Arlington. There's a need for different kinds of housing in Arlington. And there's an opportunity because you've got the data on the Broadway corridor, you've got interest in the Broadway corridor, it's a clear transit corridor, now served by Alewife and, and in the future by uh, the Green Line, a new Green Line stop, and bus routes to really do a model development to, ex to do transit-oriented housing. What I would suggest is not just make it quite that simple, because that's too simple, but you want to put up some standards, and the standards I've, I've got A through J here, but it would include, for example, a requirement for a microgrid. It would include, for example, a proportion of affordable housing. It would include, for example, an FAR of 3.2, which would mean some things are one story and some things maybe six stories high. So that there's no restriction by story. So what you're looking for is the best designs. It includes access to daylight for those buildings. So you step, you, you say, we're going to take away, we're going to absolve you of the zoning requirements for that district as they stand now. And we're going to invite you to find property owners and developers match yourself up and come to us with a proposal. And in turn, we're going to fast track you and we're going to, uh, with, with approvals, and we're going to uh, help you get the financing that you need. That's okay. It. Okay. So we'll put you on on the 27th. We'll have a deeper discussion than a discussion amongst the board once uh, we've had a chance to further digest what you provided us. Um, at least for dwelling units um, and the affordable housing issue, the um, article about balance at town meeting would be a select board issue. I wouldn't want to weigh in on that yeah. here. Uh, we can choose to support or <clears throat> not, but it isn't something I think that this board should get deeply into. And although I think this article is an excellent idea, I don't know if it's something that we would necessarily propose or is it it's not a zoning by law I mean change. the part that is uh, related to zoning is the idea <coughs> that you would fast track a project um, in any way oh the design we, yeah. I think we'd have to break this out for yeah, further that would have to be I think I think it, it, essentially in there there will be some kind of a special per, special special yeah. permit process okay. was what I would assume okay so we'll we'll Table that one for now. Let me think about the mechanics of it and discuss the mechanics of it uh, <coughs> offline with Jenny. But certainly on the 27th, I will put you on the agenda. Yeah, if you can, if you cannot let me come two. in cold, but give me some warm uh, leads on what your questions might be on the 27th. <laughs> that would be great. Sure. Okay. Someone will reach out. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to discuss zoning town meeting bylaws? You'll have extra time at open forum to discuss other items. Go ahead. Before I, um, I was wondering if we put some, something on an agenda or something where we can sit down and discuss no. exactly what we're trying to do. 
and how we propose to go about doing it. I mean, is our mission here is trying to address uh, balanced growth. I'm just giving you examples, okay? Mm -hmm. Balanced growth meaning encourage housing and business and office and all the other stuff, and how we how we go, how we about, how we go about making some zoning changes to address that. Or our mission is to address affordable housing. Our mission is to address uh, workforce housing. Right. Put, a, put a pin in that for right now, and I'm going to let you pick that up the next agenda item. Is there anyone else who wants to talk about proposals for zoning bylaw changes for spring 2020 town meeting? All right, so now I'm going to move into the next agenda item where we start to talk about the discussion that we're going to have Monday night with the select board. Okay. And that is an important thing. I mean, that's something that we've talked about <coughs> internally uh, and in these meetings for some time. Uh, I think a broad discussion of where we're headed with, this, with these conversations now that a formal dialogue is being opened up between the ARB and the select board is, is appropriate. And I think where we should begin is at that high level uh, idea of what it is we're actually trying to, to achieve and identifying all the challenges and all the needs of town, not just focusing in on one specific area. Um, I think if you begin at that high level, you start to look at all the potential benefits as well as all the potential unintended consequences of every action, then you can start to develop a real solid pathway and an action plan for tackling things not only in 21, but further on down the road. And, and I want to stress that I think we as a board should talk about that before we talk to the select board mm -hmm. about that and have our opinions and have, have a back and forth about that. You know, you know, um, you know we're talking about, you know, open space being 25 feet or 20 feet. I think that's too narrow and too right into the specifics of it. I think we need to talk about is our major concern to have more open space and have more green space in Arthur? Then let's make that a priority and say, here's how we go about doing that. Or is it, or is it we're trying to get more affordable housing? Here's how we're trying to go about doing that. Are we trying to encourage more business and more development in certain areas? Here's how we're going about to do that. And we haven't really, none of us have really talked about that, mm -hmm. given, given anybody's own opinion how we about go with that. We we're always talking about these little specifics and these little things that just, and I think we lose track of it, uh, of the bigger picture, and then, we, and then everybody, get, it all falls apart. So, you know, if we're trying to address one topic, let's talk about it. And I think we should start off with just what topics are we trying to encourage through some of these changes we're trying to uh, address. Is it balanced growth? Is it affordable housing? Is it more green space? Uh, is it correction of what the zoning was before because it's so scattered? But let's have a conscious uh, knowledge of what we're trying to do up front and then well, it could be all of those things, and then it's a question of prioritization. Then fine. I'm okay with that. But at least we state our goals. Yeah. We never ever state our goals and what we're trying to do. Are we trying to stop growth altogether and just stay where we were? I mean, I don't know. Just state it. And that, then say, here's what we're trying to do to back that up. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's weird. I was going to, just in response to you a little bit, but just for a second, because I want to talk about the agenda item. Okay. <laughs> in response to you, I would say we have an Arlington master plan, and that is our vision of growth and development and anything else in Arlington. That is technically your document for this board, and the work that you do should relate back to the Arlington master plan. You might be working on other things that correspond to and align with other plans that we're working on. Some of those plans are your plans. But a lot of them are other plans that relate to the town, like the Open Space and Recreation Plan, the Arts and Culture Action Plan, the Housing Production Plan. There's other things, too. The Housing Production Plan is one that you happen to adopt. But a lot of other plans you don't necessarily adopt, but you should be thinking about those other plans when you're making decisions. So I've brought but this up before, and you probably know where I'm going. I know where you're going with this. But I do want to talk about the agenda. <clears throat> okay. okay. I just want to answer this question yes. first. Um, the master plan is five years old as of this town meeting. It's technically even older than that because it's been kicking around since uh, at least 2011, if not 
earlier. It started. I think yeah, it started in, in 2011. In 2011, yes. Uh, and <clears throat> what I've heard in the last year or so through all the different discussions that we've had is that we've, A, achieved a number of the goals of the master, the high level goals of the master plan, mm -hmm. as far as the open space plan, the affordable housing plan, creating some of these other uh, committees, the <coughs> recodification of the zoning bylaw. And I think it's probably time to start thinking about revising the master plan itself. Now, that doesn't mean a wholesale teardown and consultant process. Uh, but what it does mean is charging the Master Plan Implementation Committee with some new tasks. They do sit underneath the ARB and they <coughs> uh, take direction from this board to, to an extent, or they should take direction to the, from this board to the entire process. Uh, and I think it's probably time to revisit that committee's priorities and membership uh, and figure out where we go so that we can have some of these conversations that Kin talks about as far as setting priorities. Look at what's been done, what's been successful, and how we can remap the master plan mm -hmm. um, from 2020 on out. Mm -hmm. And I think the master plan actually, on one level or another, encompasses all of the things Kin mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, but we haven't necessarily assigned the same priority to each of those things over the last few years. That's right. That's right. And we haven't revised, we haven't revisited the master plan as a board uh, since it was adopted. We've looked at pieces. Uh, we've taken on certain tasks um, to some success. Um, but I think some of the more difficult conversations that are now being had need to be hashed out going back to that document and saying, here's where we were in 2014. Here's where the demographics of town have changed since then. Uh, there's been a massive population turnover <coughs> and, and shift in the demographics in town and figure out how we implement things that were suggested and seemed like good ideas five or six years ago that the town maybe still wants, but maybe we need to re reorganize some of those priorities. That's not a discussion for tonight. Yeah, I was going to say, if you, if you want to talk about this more um, with maybe some preparation by staff and probably from the Master Plan master plan Implementation Committee, I mm -hmm. might ask at least the co-chair. Co is there just one chair now, right? <laughs> uh, uh, it's just Charlie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Although Joe is Joe no has longer a, on the committee, basically. He, he hasn't necessarily resigned. Yeah. Yeah, but I think we need to take a look at that. So um, if Charlie were to attend, and then we could have a maybe a deeper mm -hmm. conversation about this, and then also prepare for it, I would suggest maybe the first meeting in February. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, not the next meeting, because yeah. it's already pretty full at this point. You've got two hearings, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so then you have your continuation of all the conversations that you had about zoning amendments. Appreciate that. Uh, but so what do we talk to the select board about? Okay, so yeah. if I might just set up that conversation a little bit more. Um, so Adam and I have talked about what might be a draft agenda for that meeting. He's actually telling them, telling the select board the exact same thing or something like it right now, um, or probably about an hour ago, um, which was. Uh, the following. So we would, it's a joint board meeting, so just I'm going to run through what the agenda might look like um, and then we can talk about it if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So you'd, you know, respectively each board has to call the meeting to order. Um, we would do welcome and introductions. Adam and I will facilitate the meeting. Um, of course, you'll be a chair at the meeting and Diane will be a chair at the meeting, but um, and so therefore, if, you, if there's any other actions you wish to take during the meeting, that could still happen. But officially, Adam and I will facilitate the conversation. We thought we would start by reviewing, since it's been a while, we uh, both uh, presented on the Housing in Arlington presentation, was what it was called, um, back in the summer. So it's been some time. So we thought we would do just sort of a high level overview of that with the highlights and uh, sort of refresh everybody's memory about why we're in the room, why it's important to talk about housing, and to also uh, gain some group agreement about why we're agreeing to work together on this particular topic. Um, we would then move from there into a review of future warrant articles, which um, 
includes just an understanding, I think, for both boards respectively of each board's role in reviewing one another's warrant articles when they arise. So in this case, mostly this is the select board reviewing zoning articles and whether you know, that's something new to the town. And I think it's important to talk about that more globally and not just to focus it on this one particular matter where by you might have other zoning issues that come up that are just as important and you might want the select board to weigh in on them in the future as well. So just making sure that's clarified. And then the same thing goes for if you want, if the ARB, for example, is interested in the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund bylaw, but that's technically not a zoning bylaw, then just having some clarity about that when you're reviewing things that are not technically in one another's jurisdiction. Um, so review of future warrant articles and what that might mean and just having a collective understanding of that moving forward. Then the, the main focus and thrust of the meeting we were hoping was going to be on the outreach strategy for moving forward with the housing discussion and recommendations. And for that, we would have prepared in a draft format some ways that we could reach uh, probably more like a February 2021 special town meeting because of the timing of all of these conversations. We're basically behind about three months. We had hoped to start this conversation back in September, October. Uh, we've kind of pushed pushed a number of dates around, unfortunately. Um, now we're starting, you know, when we're going to start this conversation. And so I think looking forward and then just given that there's natural periods during the calendar year that make it very challenging to engage people. And then also it is 2020, which is a special year mm -hmm. nationally. So um, it will be difficult to keep people's attention on this topic during certain times, mm -hmm. particularly the fall which is when things could potentially turn into policy development. And so I think we want to have enough time to move into a special town meeting, but probably not December, more like February. And so taking it out of the annual town meeting and making it into the special town meeting, which I think it still deserves to be. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole idea would be to get equal agreement on that outreach strategy. What is it, who are we appropriately reaching out to, committees that should be engaged, making sure people feel as though they've had enough of, a, of time with the process to move forward through that process. That was, of course, one of the biggest things that we heard, among the biggest things that we heard in relationship to the last go through of this conversation, was how we did our outreach, who we talked with, and of course, how we addressed the concerns that were raised as they came up. And then the next thing and the last thing would be uh, the potential articles for annual town meeting, because we've already heard and are aware of a number of things that do touch on housing, I think it's important to just make it clear that there will be some talk about housing topics at the annual town meeting this spring, but that they won't be part of this, exactly what we're talking about together moving forward on. But we can't forget that things are still going to happen in the regular fashion at annual town meeting. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And then if we want to set a future meeting, meeting date with the select board, I would encourage us to do it that evening as well. And then uh, we would adjourn and allow, you know, at different points of time during the conversation for people to provide us with questions to answer about those specific things during the process. Um, so that, that was just a proposed framework of what we would talk about with the select board next week. It is going to be held next door at the central school in the main room. So we'll have sufficient seating for both boards up front and then sufficient seating for um, you know, people in the audience in the mm. room. So that's, that's the setup. Cheney, we used, to, we used, we used the word broadly housing. Mm -hmm. What does that include? What does it include? Yes. I think it includes everything. So I think it's, it, it includes it all, uh, all housing. Yeah, but what about mixed use? Does that include mixed use? Mm -hmm. It would include mixed use development because housing is part of most mm -hmm. of our mixed use uh, developments. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm talking about. I think we should talk it talk about it in terms of all housing, not just uh, one type of housing versus another. I think we might be talking less so about certain zoning districts, but I think that's something too that we need to talk about as part of this process. And then, what about commercial? I, I don't think that that's, that was the initial intention of this conversation with the select board. I think the, the initial conversation was supposed to be about housing and, and keeping focused on the housing agenda. We can talk about that, but that's, that's, that's the message that I've received throughout. Okay. I'm just thinking that when you talk about just how we want to uh, 
zone of control or encourage growth in just housing mm -hmm. is is just one aspect of how we want to see how this town, the future of this town goes. I mean, are we going to slowly turn this town into a bedroom community and have no commercial space and not talk about that at all? Or uh, we can talk about some of the industrial space that's there that that uh, that can be used for uh, converted to housing, or is it going to be encouraged to do other things? I well, there's some tandem things, just if I might. Okay. There's some tandem processes, right, that are happening at the same time in, in, in connection with yes. this conversation, perhaps, but also somewhat separately. One of them is the economic analysis of the industrial zones, which may, you know, as that process evolves, I think that's a good, dis dis you know, uh, point to bring up perhaps next week is, do they want to weigh in on that conversation? We we haven't talked about that. You know, this is that's what I'm talking about is, do we want the select board to weigh in on <laughs> on all of the zoning amendments or proposals that we're considering, including things that relate to future economic growth in town. And I think one thing that <clears throat> really does tie into housing growth of any kind, whether it's replacing like for like or increasing density or however the conversation goes, is there needs to be some sort of focus on increasing the commercial tax base as well. I think we've all become very familiar with the, the ratio yep. there. And uh, <clears throat> asking homeowners to continue to bear more of the burden of property taxes is something that needs to be discussed and mm -hmm. considered. And how, how we approach that while encouraging, I, I think we do need to encourage commercial growth in town. I think we absolutely want to encourage commercial growth in town, keeping in mind the physical restraints and characteristics of the town itself and the existing layout and, and footprint of the town. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I just, I just want to step back far enough sure, and not just say, we're just going to talk about housing. I, I'm sorry. But I, think, I think with anything, that's something we always have to keep in mind as we move forward. Because our goal is housing and, or commercial and, not just one. Yes. So, go ahead, Gene. I'm having a little bit of the same problem I think Ken is having with the, with the proposed conversation for next week because I do think we need to talk about housing, affordable workforce, and we do need to talk about how to do outreach around those things. But I think it needs to be in the context of what the town is and what people like about the town. And, and you know, a couple of things that have happened I'll, I'll use just sort of as examples. I think one of the things that a lot of people like about the town is we have these sort of three village centers, quote unquote, you know, the Heights, the center, and East Arlington. And I started thinking about that when um, the work was being done, and I read, I think, the draft on the, the potential to do something with the Heights and the industrial zones, which is sort of you know, and, and I think it's a little dangerous to do too much planning because too much planning is as bad as too little and how do you do the right one. But, you know, how do you put the housing in the context of commercial and industrial, things like that. And then when Barbara Thornton came in tonight and gave us this really interesting design competition, I think the piece of it that I would add to it is how do you create a village in East Arlington along Broadway. This isn't quite a village, right? This is a, this is. It's a, it's a beta test of what a village could look like. Right, but then how do you, right, how do you make a village out of this? Because if we're gonna talk about more density, and I think we should, and more affordable housing and more workforce housing, and I think we should, what's the context in which it's gonna happen? And I think the context would be like, how do you create a village, for example, you know, just going with what Barbara did in on Broadway in East Arlington, that would accommodate that so people could say, that's great, that's the next good place to Arlington to be, or in the Heights. So I don't think it's really complete to just talk about housing without the context that way. Okay. Do you want to say something, Rachel? No, I'm, I'm completely aligned okay. with what, what you presented. I think that you can't talk about housing without also talking about increasing the commercial tax base. They go hand in hand, and you certainly can't increase density, but then also 
without also increasing the commercial the commercial spaces that support an increased mm -hmm. density here. Go ahead, David. I, I also agree. Um, you know, I think the risk of talking about housing in isolation is uh, creating incentives uh, for housing. Whoops. Every time. <laughs> um, we never have a roll of paper towels around it. <laughs> but create, the risk is creating incentives for There's a lot of whatever incentives. type of housing it might be. Um, that that may actually result in, in the loss of commercial or industrial space, um, you know, which is something that we we really can't afford at this point in time. We've we've seen that already. Right, right. I think it's we've lost. <coughs> I think we've lost a lot of opportunity. The, the way time. things have been designed and the way things have been uh, planned and operated over the last. 40 some odd years, and you know, it's, it's kind of fallen to us at this point to have discussions that should have been had 25 years ago. Um, and we've, we've had this discussion ourselves several times. Um, I think the five of us are in alignment with how to approach this meeting next week, um, so long as there's the understanding that this is an ongoing conversation, not a one off. Right. Um, We're not going to solve everything tomorrow. No, 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 no we won't. And, and you know, it's not just up to the five of us here and the five members of the select board, uh, two of whom are going to turn over for very soon anyway, maybe, uh, at least one. Uh, <coughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing discussion. It's a town-wide discussion. It needs to be more than just the, the two boards uh, to continue on with things. And I think one of the ways we get to that is through the outreach discussion and what sort of outreach uh, we think will be worthwhile and what sort of outreach uh, both boards and associated staffs can accommodate and plan for in really what's a year's time. Now how do we get how do we get enough buy enough community buy-in to reach a representative cross section of the town and ensure that something uh, workable comes out of that? I think with the master plan, uh, you know, that it was a long two-year process to get to a document that was adopted by this board and then endorsed by town meeting by an overwhelming margin. But there you saw the buy-in from every cross-section of Arlington <coughs> that put something together that everyone could really believe in and move forward. And the implementation comes separate, any disagreements over that. Um, that goes back to what I said before about sort of re, uh, revising that. Um, but I think that's a model process to look at mm -hmm. as far as those sorts of meetings, those with those sorts of frequency, um, and really welcoming viewpoints from all over to really try to gauge where the majority is and where the vocal minority might be. Um, so I'm just trying to think of what, how to, how we merge all this into one conversation for next week. So one, one thing I could add to what I shared in terms of the draft would be that I would also, I talked about sort of giving you that review and the highlight, the, the high level kind of housing in Arlington. But maybe I should also, per, because I haven't provided this directly to the select board, of course you're aware of all of the different planning processes that are going on, but I think perhaps uh, zooming in on the ones that most relate to commercial, economic, mm -hmm. industrial development, mm -hmm. um, just so that uh, people are all on the same page about those tandem processes and how that perhaps relates, overlaps with this conversation along the way. <laughs> I don't know how yet, but I assume that along the way we will run into times where we're either looking at something that's potentially a housing issue or potentially a, a commercial or economic development issue. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you want to add to the agenda, though, specifically, that you want to make sure that we we bring up during this meeting? Put it up to you all. Take suggestions. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the thrust of where we're coming from is a relatively united, <coughs> for better or worse. Um, see where things go with the select board, but 
I think we have an idea of what we'd like to, to accomplish. Just how do we get there? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Anything else? Minutes. 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 Yeah. Minutes. So we have uh, two sets, I think, tonight. Yes. So we have November 18th. Uh, I did not. I only one thing. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, there was one thing that says the ice asked for a trench trench valve or something like that. Uh, was on the minutes. A valve. I think that's how it was spelled out. Um, it should be a drain, but they're yeah, not. Drain. But they're not doing it anyways. But that's okay. <laughs> 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 All right. It's good to re review these minutes. Uh, oh, ring. Ring. Okay, yeah. Yeah, trench ring. ring. Drain. Yes, got it. Yeah. And I have just one small mm -hmm. item um, on this on page three mm -hmm. of, of the notes um, from, sorry, from the 18th. Um, in the third paragraph where I'm talking about the deliveries, my specific point was related to ensuring that there was no double parking. And that's that's just not, the, the point about the double parking isn't reflected in here, but that was the whole point of speaking um which says Ms. Embury asked about deliveries loading yeah. a special truck that was related to wanting to ensure that um double parking did not occur on Mass Ave okay right I do remember that point okay Gene or David I have no comments on the 18th okay November 18th no comments so with that I'll take a motion to approve as amended so moved second all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. And then December 16th. Jean? I had no comments on the 16th. Right. Rachel? I had David one. shaking his head, so go ahead. Um, I'm just going to find the paragraph. So it was on page two of, of this here. Mm -hmm. um, so in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, mm -hmm. I'm in the middle of the page where I said, that um, the Atwood House is listed in Arlington to sort of yes. historically. Yeah. The point was that um, it was not a hardship because it still was in 2009, which was contrary to what um, Mr. Ines presented. And was listed as such in 2009. In 2009. Per the, per the special permit per, yeah. condition. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the, it was actually in the decision. It was, yes. yes. It was. Actually, I've seen people in there measuring. Good. Fantastic. Any so I move, oh, we adopt the minutes of December 16 as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Aye. moving on to our open forum. If there's anyone who wishes to speak, items not to be discussed, but if you'd like to raise your hand and be heard, please do so. Mr. Seltzer. Uh, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, First thing I want to mention is that I went to the board's website, which has been um, updated, um, and now it has links to some of the um, plans for current projects. It's a big improvement, and I thank you for that. It's really helpful. Um, I also want to say that conversation among the board members in the last 15 minutes is some of the most interesting discussion that I've observed you having um, in recent times. and. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, commend you for that. Um, the one thing that does concern me is next week's meeting, your joint meeting with the select board. From what I heard from the agenda, uh, you have Adam and Jenny presenting to both boards, I, and you're talking about outreach efforts. What provision is there going to be at next week's meeting for members of the public to speak? I know that I have some things that are um, directly related to what you have to say. I'm sure Barbara would like to speak. Oh, hey, I'll, I'll yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there are a lot of residents who have pretty intelligent um, remarks to make, which are quite relevant to what you're discussing. Um, will there be a forum for them, and what format will that take? The agenda will include Q and A for all of the relevant agenda items. Uh, so I'm not asking for a q and A. I, I think we, um, well, people so on the, the, or various sides of the issue have very useful information that they'd like to provide comparable to the 
presentation that you and Adam are going to be presenting, um, rehashing stuff from last mm -hmm. summer. And I think it would be a disservice to the idea of public involvement and outreach if all we were re um, allowed to do is just do question and answer. So there, there will be that, sorry to frame it that way perhaps, but that there would be an opportunity for people to comment on each agenda item as we're moving through so that it's clear, you know, if there are any questions, but also if there are any comments. Will we be able to use the projector? Um, there is not, we were not planning to have any projector put up at the, at the forum. Could that's, we have one? I can investigate if we can put up the screen. I think that's the biggest challenge over there. So we can, we can It doesn't up. seem to be a, a big technical challenge. We will follow up with you separately okay. to determine that. And if you'd like to use it, we can talk about how to include that on the well, agenda. I, I would really, really appreciate it. I think it could be a lot more useful meeting with the two boards there if you allowed some degree of um, presentation from from different viewpoints of the public. Yeah, thank you. Barbara. Um, I, I don't want to cede my time if, if Don's going to negotiate time for me, but I do want to say from my perspective, the most important thing about this meeting is for the two boards to talk to each other. So I'm really curious to know, and if you can say afterward there will be another meeting where we can respond, but I really want to see these two very important boards, particularly on housing, have the time, given that you're going to bookend it within a two-hour process, I'm assuming, uh, that you have the time to ask each other questions mm -hmm. and, and get personal. Yeah. And that, that was the, uh, the intention of this meeting, was for the two boards to speak with one another and to just to remind everybody of the purpose of the meeting, two boards to talk with one another and to gain agreement about the way to move forward together and to agree upon the outreach strategy. Those were really the three priorities of the meeting. I and think as I agree part with that, Bob, I think, sure I think there'll be other meetings uh, once this initial meeting is uh, condoned. Because we've been pretty much working separately on our own. And I remember asking for this last year so that we can work together in unison mm -hmm. or at least share some same views. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you got to give us a chance to at least do something. Mm -hmm. And then this, and I think the opportunity for public involvement may come later once we have well, talked. I think, it, I think it will come later and it will come often. But yeah. it may not be one day, you know, right at the but start. I think the thing is you got to give us enough of a chance to do it. And, and it's, it's been a long time coming to make this happen. And I, I, I want to have enough time for us mm. to actually really thoroughly get into some, that's why I was asking for all the stuff here and, you know, and I really want to talk about it in public. And then I'm sure we can have all the opportunities to share um, Don's view or, or other people's views later on. I know we're not gonna, um, Try to push that aside, but I think it'll give us a chance. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, this is really the first conversation that these two boards have had in. I don't know ever, the last ever. time. <laughs> <laughs> For all intents and purposes, of both boards, and it's uh, you know, keep in mind that it's a large result of the conversations that were had last spring, where there were accusations of not enough public participation, and so it's time to to let the boards speak and do our jobs. Uh, and figure out how best to involve those of you who are frequent and uh, helpful participants. I, I think um, it, it is very valuable for the boards um, to come to an understanding about how to move forward on, on these issues. Um, and, uh, or, or I, I think to be more precise, um, how to pro uh, what to what proposals uh, to pursue uh, to move forward? Because I think um, part of the public engagement process is is to vet those proposals with the public and and get feedback on them, rather than spend the next year just trying to get community buy-in on the proposals that we have decided are the way to move forward. Oh, I, I, yeah. absolutely. I, I don't think that we're going to come up with yeah. five warrant articles that both boards start to, to market, essentially. 
Monday night for the next year. I think the important thing is to figure out where the priorities of the redevelopment board lie, where the priorities of the select board lie, based on the discussions that we have all been having yeah. for the last, not only the last six months, but over the last year plus. And we've gotten input from uh, the, the citizen, the various citizens groups that are out there. We've seen the information, we've heard the information and taken it in with a very high degree of seriousness. Yeah. And that's why these conversations are happening. And now how do we take it, the, the discussion that we had is how do we take all this information in and now that both boards are sitting in the room together, figure out where those joint, joint priorities lie and how to begin that approach. Yeah. I, I just see it as a, a community process led by the two boards. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I see whatever specific proposals might ultimately come out of that process, um, I think are probably quite likely to end up being different than uh, what we might think at mm -hmm. the start. Certainly. Certainly. Go ahead, James. So while Don's offer to do a presentation I think sounds compelling, I think the meeting next week is really not the time for that. I think the meeting next week is the time for the two boards to talk and interact. And my concern about saying to Don, Don, come and do this presentation, is that's one presentation, and it just happens to be you who was here who was asking to do it. And what about other people in the community who might have different points of view, want to have different presentations? It's too limiting. I think maybe there'll be another meeting where we will ask a lot of people from the community to come in and do presentations so we get a wide variety of inputs and views and not just limited to you because you come to the meetings and want to do it. So while I think it's it's a nice offer, I think we should postpone it to another day after the two boards have had the opportunity to meet and to talk about things and then maybe there'll be a day when we invite a lot of people to come in and to do those sorts of presentations. I, That's my I, I see what you're saying too, and I sort of agree. I, I, I mean, we've been looking forward to this joint meeting of the two boards as a way for it to interact with both of you at the same time. And it was sort of promised last June, I believe, when it was first mentioned. And it has been delayed over and over again. Um, and I, you know, perhaps you're right. There is, with the one week, there isn't enough time to publicize it so that all the interested parties who have useful input can speak. But there, when you but there should be a time for it. Yeah. Question and answer is not a great way of interacting with the public. So when we have the conversation next week, we would have a, a draft of a, a community engagement plan, essentially, with, mm -hmm. and a strategy which could, you know, I can take these this feedback tonight and roll it into that and share that for the conversation next week. Because mm -hmm. I, th I think there would be, a, the, the engagement process will include a long, upfront process of engaging people in this conversation in various formats, I might add. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think the, and the that, outcome that helps us of, to develop things. I think the outcome of, sorry to talk over it. That's just, happened. It's getting late. That's I'm excited. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm excited too. That's why I'm talking. To go home. Yes. Uh, and to, to go to this meeting Monday night, of course. Um, I, you know, I think the outcome, to get back to one of the things that, that David was saying, is not specific ideas, but just priorities, areas of priorities that need to be discussed, not necessarily a direction of how to answer those questions, but what are the questions that we should be asking over the next several months, and how do we reach out mm -hmm. to make sure that we're bringing in all the right people, you know, yep. okay. the citizens groups, the interested parties, the people who aren't usually on board, um, yeah, that's, that's how we move forward here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else from any other members of the public on other items? A larger audience than usual. Thank you all for bearing with us. Um, I take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.